So not many weaknesses. They're good everywhere. They're very experienced. Probably the best passing attack we've seen so far this year. Who said that? I'll tell you coming up next. You are Locked On Trojans, your daily podcast on the USC Trojans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Fight on, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Culkin, and thanks for making Locked On USC your first listen every day. Whether you're watching on YouTube or wherever you download your podcasts, we are free. And thanks a lot for coming along for a ride. I hope you're enjoying the show. We're growing really fast. So if you are watching on YouTube and you haven't already done so, why not hit that subscribe button? It means a lot. And, uh, if you're not watching on YouTube and you just prefer listening and not looking at this ugly face, I get it. Go ahead and hit me uh, with some feedback at my Twitter at Mark Culkin. All right. So the team was back in full pads Tuesday morning. Uh, they're preparing for, for a Fresno state squad this week. Um, that looks to be pretty good. They took uh, an Oregon state team that looks to be pretty good down to the wire before losing at home. Um, so after watching the Stanford film, um, there, you know, Lincoln Riley said uh, there wasn't too much uh, that surprised him. Um, so after that, you know, he, he, I think Lincoln, you know, yeah, the team won 41 to 28. Uh, there was a little concern about the way they finished the game in the second half. Uh, so, you know, Lincoln addressed that and uh, he said, you know, we had a pretty good beat on it uh, during the game, a ton of positives, uh, but there's a ton to get better at. Uh, one of the one of the issues uh, that I think uh, the coach is going to be um, looking to fix quickly um, on the at least as far as the offensive efficiency is concerned, going playing four quarters Um you know, after that first half where they were five for five on their first five possessions, scoring touchdowns, um, you know, I asked him after I asked him after practice if uh, he felt that maybe they they took their foot off the gas a little bit. And Riley said, "quote I think it's very possible. At times, we intentionally slowed it down a bit, little bit, but slow it down doesn't mean to uh, doesn't mean don't execute. You can." You can call a play and snap it with 30 seconds left or snap it with five seconds left. You still got to execute. And the reality is when we slowed it down, our execution went down. Um, I agree. Now, a lot of that had to do, I don't think he was going to make excuses, but if you watch the game, and I actually had the chance to rewatch, uh, rewatch the game earlier this afternoon. Um, and, you know, the third down stuff that was going on, players slipping, uh, holding penalties, just just a confluence of events that kind of just kind of got them out of sync. So um, while he was talking about, you know, maybe the play calling and executing can get better, just overall the team offensively didn't, uh, didn't perform up, up to their expectation is what uh, I guess he was trying to get across. Uh, but he, he did want to mention that you know, the third quarter did give the team the opportunity, uh, you know, to kind of run the clock and, and develop to, you know, at least try and develop its run game uh, during some live action and, you know, kind of just, you know, work the clock, get that thing going um, because you're going to need that to win games down the stretch. So uh, he, he said, you know, it's not necessarily a, a, a four minute mode, but when you've got to be able to operate at different paces um, and when you slow down in the second half, we obviously did not operate the way we expected to. So, um, you know, does this really come down to complacency? And, you know, Travis Dye, uh, you know, he talked about it after the game as well. Um, so I asked him, you know, how that happens. How, how does complacency kind of set in? You know, after game two, 
uh, considering, you know, the team is, you know, trying to rebuild that culture. They're trying to buy in and trust everything that, you know, Lincoln Riley and his staff is trying, you know, trying to implement, trying to get the team to trust. And if you watch the full post-game reaction uh, from Lincoln Riley, we have that up over there on wrsc.com, uh, the full video interview after practice from Tuesday. Uh, you can get all of his comments and, and put it in the context. Don't have enough time to do it here on this show. We want to just give you the highlights. Uh, but as far as Travis Dye, when I asked him the same question, uh, he he related to basically it's it's about handling success. Uh, that's all it was. We had a lot of success in the first half, and we didn't handle it well in the second half. I love that candor, by the way. We thought we had it in the bag. We thought they were just going to lay down. This is college football. Nobody lays down, end quote. I really love uh, listening to uh, Travis Dye speak. Very mature young man, and he's very candid when he speaks. So, um, yeah, just it's more of a just more of a, the learning curve for this team to, to, to keep getting better as the season goes along. Uh, on the injury front, uh, just a reminder again, um, unless Lincoln Riley mentions a player by name, we can't. Um, I like to maintain my access to practice, so uh, we're not going to uh, we're not going to push that envelope too hard. However, on that note, um, outside of the quarterbacks who are always wearing the uh, the yellow no contact jersey, uh, USC was definitely making a fashion statement today at practice. Um, there was a lot of players wearing the yellow no contact. Not going to mention names, uh, but. Uh, Quite a few of them were part of the uh, the two D, both sides of the ball. But again, um, this is probably more just out of precaution. You know, no reason to uh, get these guys uh, overly dinged up this early in the season, especially your key players. Uh, so, since Riley did talk about uh, Cortland Ford and Romelo Height. Um, you know, he said that you know both of those guys were going to take it early. Um, or take it easy in the early part of the week. You know, Romello has his arm in a sling. I do not anticipate him playing this week, period. That's just my gut instinct. Um, he said the same thing about Portland Ford. He, you know, they want to give him a, the early part of the week off, and they'll, they'll reevaluate both of them uh, this week. Um, I, like I said, I, I don't anticipate Romello coming back and playing on Saturday. However, a little birdie did uh, sing something to me that we should probably expect to see Cortland Ford back at practice tomorrow. Uh, if you're watching this uh, Wednesday morning, uh, the team practices Wednesday afternoon. So we'll have another update on Locked on USC uh, Thursday, on Thursday's episode. Uh, so we'll see how much uh, Cortland is able to do uh, during Wednesday's practice. Now, his competition, uh, has, you know, we, we've talked about this. Um, it, it's been one of the, I, I don't want to say contentious points about, you know, Lincoln and his staff not being able to name a starting left tackle. But uh, him and Bobby Haskins, you know, let's just say they've got six starters. And at the moment, um, you know, Bobby said his routine isn't going to change despite, you know, there's a good chance he's going to be playing more on Saturday than just uh, alternating every other offensive series like he has been with Cortland so far. He said, basically, my preparation never changes. Every week, everybody is out here preparing like they're going to play every snap of the game because that's what it takes to win, end quote. Uh, you know, some of the bad, you know, from, I guess you want to take away from Stanford, there's not a whole lot, but the USC team, they were penalized nine times for 100 yards. And uh, Mikai Blackman, you know, he played a big role in those numbers. Nevertheless, uh, Riley had his seniors back. Uh, he said, you know, I thought Blackman was awesome. He gave up one glance ball that came out of technique a little bit. Other than that, it was PBUs, interceptions, and competitive plays. I talked about that before. Uh, we like him matched up against anybody. The way he's playing and competing, the guys he goes against here in practice are good players and it's a battle every single day. 
So that's a one-on-one -on -one matchup that we're very, very comfortable with, end quote. I think overall, um, from my assessment, Tuesday offered a pretty physical and a, a good high energy practice. Uh, this is, you know, this is when the defense gets their work in against the scout team offense. And what I was able to see is Solomon Bird is moving up the depth chart after his performance uh, this Saturday against Stanford. You had a couple of sacks, and then you know, obviously with Romello Height, kind of a question mark. Um, you know, will Corey Foreman push hard during this week of practice? And, you know, will he start or is Solomon work? Again, is Solomon Bird already passed him up? It's a big week for uh, for that rush end position and Roy Manning. I mean, behind uh, Corey and Solomon Bird, you know, next man up, I believe, is going to be Julian Simon. Will they have to, you know, will the depth be, will be, will it be tested this week? And here's a really another positive sign that USC might be back, maybe a little bit ahead of schedule uh, in the national spotlight. Uh, forget that they're number seven in the AP poll. You know, the polls are what they are. Uh, however, the NFL, it, at least it felt this way today at practice, like they sent a representative from every NFL team. Um, I can tell you just, I saw for sure, uh, reps from Chicago, Arizona, the Giants, Jets, Cleveland, Detroit, Atlanta, Indianapolis. And that list was much longer. Um, and that's because the talent level has been significantly upgraded uh, through the transfer portal. USC is showing an exciting brand of football to watch. And I guess the NFL is getting their draft evaluation started really early for with USC starting in September. And this was significant today at practice because... Uh, USC was hosting the Mililani High School football team uh, who came over from Hawaii, and they were getting a first-hand tour uh, with Annie Hansen, um, and they were getting a, a, a good visual history support, um, history lesson with some visual support, seeing all those NFL scouts watching practice. So you can bet uh, all those uh, kids from the 808, they were impressed. Uh, I know that it, it caught my eye. So if uh, if I'm betting that I'm going to go ahead and bet that USC is going to be well represented come uh, the 2023 NFL draft. And then, if you don't believe me, head on over to betonline.net because they're your number one source for all of your pro and college football betting needs and sports information this season. You can find all the latest football league developments, game matchups, news and podcasts, including this year's opening week games uh, that the NFL just had. I don't know. Were you impressed with the NFL? I thought there were some good games. Bet Online is also your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. They are your fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite sports and events, including Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. Okay, so was Lincoln Riley using coach speak? Um, did he take a page from the playbook uh, with speaking coach? Or should USC fans be concerned um, with Riley's film analysis when he was talking about Fresno State? When he, because he was the one who said, not many weaknesses. They're good everywhere. They're very experienced. Probably the best passing attack we've seen so far this year. Yeah, those were Lincoln Riley's words, and not Jeff Tedford's, Fresno State head coach. So uh, Lincoln also, you know, he said after watching film that you know they know how to win. They've obviously got a staff. Um, a staff of guys that are extremely experienced and know how to get it done at this level. I think uh, they're always some of the tough, those are always some of the toughest types of teams because you just don't identify a ton of, a ton of weaknesses on tape and you know, you've got to be on your game End quote. Well, here's the other thing. Um, Fresno state, they also know how to crap the bed. That's me saying that. That's not Lincoln Riley. I want to make that perfectly clear. Uh, they they turn the ball over in the red zone. 
uh, if not, you know, turning the ball over physically, uh, they'll turn it over on downs. Uh, you know, the Bulldogs are hoping to, against Oregon State last week, they were hoping to get their first win against a Pac-12 team in, in 10 years. So this is what happened at home against Oregon State. They drove with inside the Beavers' 25-yard line. And I, I mentioned this on yesterday's episode, but it wor- it's worth repeating. Uh, they were inside Oregon State's 25-yard line seven times, and they were only able to turn those trips into two touchdowns. Their kicker missed a 34-yard field goal, a 34-yard field goal uh, after one red zone drive. And then Fresno State had to settle for field goals four other times for 12 points, if you do the math. And then their their touchdown, uh, they had a touchdown run in the third quarter until Jake Hayner, their quarterback, had that uh, late fourth quarter touchdown. Against this USC team with Lincoln Riley uh, at home, that is a recipe for disaster. There's period. There's no other way to say that. Um, you know, Jake. Jake said after I guess maybe after practice today for the for the Bulldogs, we moved the ball well. We did a lot of good things, but you have to score touchdowns. Um, some of that is on me. I have to do a better job of decisions down in the red zone. Actually, Jake said that after the game against Oregon State. So you know, they essentially had a chance to beat Oregon last year at Oregon, and they did the same thing inside the red zone. Um, They just kept turning the ball over. And so maybe that's why USC is still a 12 and a half point favorite uh, going into the game Saturday at home at the Coliseum, kickoff 7.30 p.m., that everybody anticipates should be a sellout. USC is going to be well represented. They're 2-0, number seven in uh, in the AP poll. Fresno State travels very well. So um, it's going to be a big crowd. And, you know, this is what Jake, I think, said after today's practice for Fresno. Uh, He was being sarcastic when he said it. He's wondering why this game is even being played uh, because no one's giving them a chance. You know, they lost at home against Oregon State. They got to travel on the road. They got to face the big, you know, the giant that's been awoken. They're scoring points at a a rapid pace you know, rapid clip. And again, they're 12 and a half point underdogs. Um, In reality, Jake's like, he can't wait to play this game. You know, he rooted for the Trojans growing up. It's, it's also been said that, you know, uh, he, he wanted a a scholarship offer to play for the Trojans. Fresno state is going to be that proverbial chip on the shoulder team. Um, You all, and, and that's what I think Lincoln Riley was alluding to. Um, you've got to come ready to play because Fresno will come to play, ready to play. You know, you got players on the team that, um, like Nico Remigio, he's a Pac-12 caliber player. He was at Cal before he transferred to Fresno State. Um, you've got Raymond Scott, former linebacker at USC. Definitely Pac-12 caliber. He wants He wants some playing time. He found a home at Fresno State. So you're going to have some players on that roster who are coming back home. A large chunk of it is from Southern California. They're going to want to look good in front of family and friends. Uh, so USC, the team, coaching staff, they've got to be prepared to play. Uh, Travis Dye knows better. As I mentioned, um, Oregon played, excuse me, Fresno played up in Eugene at Oregon last year. And uh, Travis kind of echoed uh, Riley's sentiments uh, because, you know, Travis, he's got firsthand experience. And so he said, you know, they fought when he was asked about Fresno after Tuesday's practice at USC. He said they fought really, really hard and they will fight hard against us, too. So having that kind of experience and making sure guys know not to take this game lightly at all. This will be one of the hardest games on our schedule for sure. So again, you go back to uh, what uh, Travis said about complacency and not, you know, 
making sure that the team understands that nobody's going to lay down. This is college football. The game is never over. Strange things happen. Uh, Travis made sure to, he's going to make sure that point gets across this week at practice. Um, especially if the press is reminding him about it. And again, it wasn't one of those, I, I wasn't pressing Travis and trying to get you in a gotcha moment. But again, it those are the types of things that, that catch my mind, you know, catch my ear. Um, when you're talk when you're talking about trying to rebuild the culture and Lincoln Riley's talking about trusting game two shouldn't be where the team is already feeling comfortable saying, all right, you know, we can turn it on whenever we want. This team has not earned that right. So watching, you know, maybe learning what happened in the second half against Stanford, blessing in disguise, uh, learn you got to play four quarters and Fresno state is a team that will make you play four quarters. So I still think USC is going to win big. I gave my prediction yesterday, but as a reminder, I got USC eventually winning this game 52 to 23. Watch uh, this game will be much closer. <laughs> Hopefully I'm right. <laughs> All right. So, why is USC playing on the Pac-12 network next week against Oregon State when both of those programs could possibly be 3-0 um, when the tra- t- you know USC travels up to Oregon State next week after Fresno? And Corvallis has been one of USC's own little personal house of horrors when they're ranked really high. And if they are, you know, undefeated 3-0, you know, they're probably going to be ranked a little bit higher than number seven. We'll see how the team's in front of them, uh, how that, how their how game plays out. Um, but like I said, strange things, strange things happen up there. And, uh, you know, it's going to be weird because they're only going to have half of a stadium erected for this game. So I think uh, 26,000 will be able to watch this game live up in Corvallis. Um So, USC is going to be on the Pac-12 network for that game. And some people are a little concerned about why. You know, this is a perfect opportunity for the Pac-12 to, you know, maybe highlight two undefeated teams. Well, by contract, uh, every team in the Pac-12 has to play on the Pac-12 network three times. Um, USC already has one of those contests. They got it out of the way when they played Rice. Again, part of the contract, one of your out-of-conference games has to be on the Pac-12 network. Well, USC played plays Rice out-of-conference. They play Notre Dame out-of-conference. And they play Fresno State out-of-conference. The Fresno State game has already been picked up by FS1. So that left a, uh, a decision. When you look ahead at USC's schedule, um, you know, who who are you going to pick? Who, you know, which game do you want to put on the Pac-12 network later in the season if you don't want to put Oregon State now? So here, this is what the, this is the slate of contests that, the Pac-12 has on TV this weekend. So from 11 a.m. you at 11 a.m. the Pac-12 network will be showing UCLA at Colorado. One o'clock, you've got the uh, Fox Big Fox. They picked up the Oregon Washington State game. Oregon's number 25. 2:30 time slot. You've got Arizona Cal on the Pac-12 network. Makes sense. And then at 6.30 p.m., Pac-12 Network, number 7 USC, um, will be at Oregon State. So I apologize. This is the slate for next week. <clears throat> and then 7.30 p.m., you got Stanford at Washington State on FS1. And then 7.30 p.m., Utah is at Arizona State, which will be on either ESPN or ESPN2. So... Because USC and Fresno State are playing this weekend at 7.30, the only other option if 
if you kept USC off the Pac-12 network against Oregon State, do you want them playing at 7.30 back-to-back weeks? I guess that's what it came down to. So, you know, I guess let's just be happy that the Trojans only have to deal with this issue for this year and the year after before they finally get to the Big Ten because this is what it is. Um, They got a crappy... You know, regional network with or national network. I don't know what you want to call it with the Pac-12 network. Um, you know, when you look ahead at the USC's future schedule, if they continue to win, uh, the the other networks are going to want to keep USC um, on those networks. And that we're talking about Big Fox, ESPN, ABC, FS1. Um, you know, the Trojans are going to host Arizona State. Uh, they've got Washington State coming up. They travel, you know, to Utah. You know, obviously, those games are going to be on the bigger networks. Colorado is on a Friday night, and FS1 has already picked that up. So, again, it was just kind of a, a crappy hand that was dealt. Hopefully, um, everyone will be able to watch USC versus Oregon State, two undefeated teams. They'll find a way to, on the pack. Find a way to view it on the Pac-12 network because that's where it's going to be. If you can't get a ticket, one of those lucky 26,000 that will be available that mostly Oregon State fans will have. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. We're out of here, but you know, uh, you get me five days a week. I will be back again when you're done checking out Locked on USC. Got to head on over. Check out the Locked on Pac-12 network. I don't know if you saw it yet. I was on there. It's already up and published. We were. Uh, I was on that episode this morning with Spencer McLaughlin talking everything about USC and why the offense is ahead of schedule, so efficient, doing as well as they are. You got to go check that out. And then when you're done with that, head on over to WeRSC.com because as you can see, 30 minutes, I can keep talking, but um, Why? Head on over to WeRSC.com, get all of your recruiting information from Scott Schrader. Eric McKinney and I are covering the team. Chris Arledge has a great musings that you do not want to miss. And again, you've got the uh, weekly Inside the Trojan Huddle podcast with Greg Katz, your host. He also does, in my humble opinion, and his not obvious and not so obvious. We got you covered for all of your news and notes. Until then, you know what to do.